Hello, and welcome to The Big Questions, our new monthly podcast series where we explore a range of perspectives on the major themes guiding the economy and markets long term. I'm your host, John Briggs. As we look at the one year anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, this feels like a poignant moment to look not just at that conflict, but the geopolitical landscape overall. To discuss this, I'm pleased to be joined once again by Scott Livingston, the international advisor to NatWest Group. Scott recently retired from the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office after 24 years of service. Prior to that, he spent a dozen years as a Royal Marine officer, and his service was shaped by global security issues, especially 9-11, including terrorism, cyber, and hostile state actors. Through multiple postings in South Asia, Scott served in Madrid and held senior leadership appointments in London, and as a conman to the government communications headquarters. His contribution was recognized by the award of a member of the Order of British Empire for Gallantry in 1995, followed by an order officer, excuse me, of the Order of the British Empire 2021 and the CMG in 2021 for service to British diplomacy. Scott, thank you once again for joining us. John's a pleasure to be here. So right to Ukraine, we've hit the one year anniversary of the conflict, a conflict that's lasted longer than most thought. I don't think we'll need to review the situation to a large degree, but right now we're in the midst of what appears to be a new Russian offensive with the previously called up recruits hitting the field. So what's the near term impact and outlook on your view? And then we'll take a step back after that to look at more of the medium term. Sure. Yeah, you're, you're right, John. We're, we're about five weeks into a Russian offensive, and it's and it's a grinding offensive. They are creeping forward in in in, in measured in meters rather than kilometers in, in the front line, and, and effectively being held at bay by quite quite courageous Ukrainian defense. So there isn't a Russian offensive. It will continue. We may see a spike tomorrow and the day after. Um, um, to commemorate the anniversary. Um, it's very unlikely that this, this Russian offensive will generate a strategic shift, but it undoubtedly is it is it's generating enormous casualties, um, primarily, unfortunately, Russian soldiers that are, are, are being thrown in, thrown in in quite horrendous conditions. But in terms of a strategic out, out, outlook, it's not going to change terribly much. Um, waiting in the, in the background, there is anticipation of a Ukrainian counteroffensive. Um, and the timing of that will will depend on two things: either either a either an opportunity presents itself on the battlefield, the Ukrainians have, have proven to be very adaptable and very agile on the battlefield, or more likely the arrival of upgraded weapons uh, that we've seen promised in the past months from from the West, from the US, from UK, and from from NATO allies, um, and in particular long range missiles. So I think the idea that for Ukrainian counteroffensive is is something that will that we will see in the coming months and and that could well be the breakthrough um of, many people will hope it would be the breakthrough that would that would lead to some form of um a rebalance on the battlefield all right so i want to touch on that shipment of weapons and or the increasing uh support that we're seeing in military hardware i mean when we look at think about uh, the day-to-day and markets and, and companies you know it's the the conflict's a little bit moved to the background but it seems to me that it continues to escalate. You know, U.S. and West provides funding and equipment, artillery and ammunition. Biden just had a surprise visit. Russia calls up and deploys more troops. You know, now the the West is sending tanks. The U.K. is talking about planes. You know, where does this stop? How long can the U.S. continue supporting <laughs> Zelensky? And is saying like this is just going to go on as long as it takes? Is that realistic? So there is a real tension between the rhetoric of. of- of as long as it takes, which is one of Biden's most powerful messages this week in, in Warsaw and in Kiev. Now, the, the tension there is with the debate back home, which is about not getting involved in forever wars. So without a doubt, Biden, it sounds brilliant in, in Eastern Europe for Biden to turn up and, and do what he's done this week. But back home, he's got a problem. He's got a problem in the political front and, and he and the West have got a problem in the industrial front in actually ramping up the production lines. Now, that second one can happen, but it will take time. The first one, the political challenge he has, I think, is shaped by the upcoming US election. And my deduction from that is that that, that, that from from, from uh, uh, Joe Biden's point of view, he needs he needs some, some form of success on the battlefield or some momentum towards success before this autumn, before we really start to get into the 2024 US election campaign and, and the primaries. So I think you're right. There is an issue here in sustainability, but I think the West, um, given enough investment, can dial up the industrial base and 
And if the timeline works out, then Biden can survive the political pressure. Okay. And as all this keeps going, how real is the risk of NATO involvement, either on purpose or by an accident from one side or the other? So, so, so I, st I still believe, and I, this has the people who have listened to the last one, I will see that I'm, I'm being consistent here. I still think that all parties are um, actively managing this campaign to keep it contained, both geographically and in terms of weapon escalation. Um, I, I think I think I'll draw an example of the, this this story that the the, the 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 Americans warned Moscow that Biden would be in Kiev. That sounds realistic to me. Now it. That being the case, that would suggest that Moscow took a decision not to use Biden's visit as an opportunity to escalate. And for me, I'm I'm taking from that that that, that Moscow still wishes to see this as a as a, a campaign in Ukraine and not as a full spectrum multinational war with NATO and across a, across a very very large front line. And I think the same is, is in NATO. I think that's why. Um, we're seeing this very carefully calibrated um, um, uplift in capabilities and the debate that we've all seen about tanks, about artillery, and as you mentioned, John, about jets. So for me, that the fact that we're seeing these decisions being made still suggests to me that there is active management to keep this away from a full-on war with NATO. And so therefore, the, the risk remains accidental escalation. Um, um, uh, you know, missiles landing in, in Poland or elsewhere, or some form of um, um, destabilization. For example, in Moldova, we've seen stories this week that that could be that could be a point, and that would need careful handling. And I think we we need to we need to be tracking that in the coming weeks. You mentioned that line of communication, and we've talked about this before in a little bit with China, which we will of course get to in a little bit. But it is somewhat reassuring that that line of communication is open enough for them to have that conversation and alert you know the uh, moscow that that biden is going to be en route or in territory uh because we worry so i well, i worry sometimes that you know about accidental encounters between the china and the us and making sure that there's that line of communication um so but when you think about the putin side and the moscow side i mean he's he's and maybe this is just a western perspective from my point of view but he strengthened nato western defense budgets are on the rise I would say the reputation of the Russian army is probably taken a hit. Um, assuming he doesn't win outright, what is what do you think he's at this point is he trying to achieve? So, well, well, you're right, and that's why I struggle to see a scenario where Russia emerges from this campaign in a stronger position. I think I would add to your list, and I know we'll come on to China, but I would add to your list that that, that undoubtedly he's positioned Russia now as a subordinate to China in in that relationship, and that's a, that's a massive shift. From, from a Moscow point of view, um, in terms of what what could what is he hoping to achieve, then there's a there's a really bleak pers um, um, interpretation or answer to that question, John, which is to effectively keep Ukraine in a, in a state of ungovernable. You know, it's an ungovernable state. It's a non-functioning state. So it's it's a it's a colossal sort of um a, 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 a campaign of attrition against against Ukraine as a functioning state. Now that would be a desperate state of affairs, and it would it would mean that the war effectively continues for a very long time. But I think that could be the fallback position. He's realised, I think, that the conquering Ukraine is just not within his scope. So therefore, the next best thing: recapture or hold on to the territories in the east and hopefully in the south if he can, but effectively to keep Ukraine as this ungoverned state and well away from um, a European integration. I would I would suspect that's what he's aiming for. Yeah, and that makes sense. I mean, if part of the original goal was to keep Ukraine from moving, continue to shift to the West. You know, if you have it in a constant state of conflict, then it can't really do either one. Um, obviously not an ideal situation. I have this thought in the back of my head where, again, in some ways the conflict, it, it's always present, but it's a little bit more in the background as far as you know, day-to-day -day risk scenarios for, but is that just because we've gotten lucky and had a mild winter in Europe? Whereas if, if it was cold and gas prices were high and energy prices were high, you know, there might be, I don't know if that means more escalation of the conflict or more support, or it would be more prominent. I mean, if we have a, you know, in other words, I know that there's been shifts in energy consumption in Europe and, and now natural gas terminals built in Germany and contracts with Algeria and, and the Middle East and stuff. But is, you know, if, if we head into next year and and we just have a brutal winter, is this a, just a different situation, or was that a related? Thing? 
No, I, I listen. I think it's it's all of the above. I'm glad you mentioned all of those other mitigants that were put in place. You know, the Germans, the Germans, astounding piece of work for the Germans to put in an LNG terminal uh, in v- a very short order. The, the 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 bending of some some contracts in the Middle East to support Europe. My 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 sense is that Europe's in a good place when it comes to the energy campaign. I think this. So I buy into the story recently published that effectively Moscow lost the energy war. Um, um, and I think that will continue. Now, that doesn't mean we can be complacent. And, you know, lots of stuff can happen between now and next winter. Next winter could be harsh, as you say. But my understanding is that Europe's in a much better place from here on in, including on the transition to other sources of energy. That, 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 that leverage from Moscow is much diminished. Um, so I, I, I'm feeling reasonably confident of that. But in terms of why why doesn't it feel like a war in Western Europe, then there's a, there's a whole other conversation about how our media works, I think, John. And, and we mustn't forget that the bottom line is it's a Ukrainian soldiers and Ukrainian civilians who are suffering. Um, it feels very different in Western Europe. My understanding is if you're sitting in Poland or if you're sitting in the, in, 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 in the Baltics, then there's a different perception as to the threat. From 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 Russia, um, uh, um, but here sitting in in UK or, or Western Europe, then you're right. It can feel it can feel somewhat at a, di- at a distance, and I think that will persist. Um, and it could that could make it difficult for policymakers to maintain the the, the broad support, particularly if economic conditions will continue to 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 face hardships in terms of cost of living, etc. In the West, yeah. So I was thinking too with all these elections coming up in the in the coming years, but we'll come come back to that as well. Okay, so I do want to transition to China, but still regarding related to Ukraine is where I'll start there. But, you know, obvi- you mentioned this before, Russia's becoming a little more, I don't know if subservient is the right word, but maybe it is. Um, economic ties are certainly increasing. China now accounts for 20% of Russian exports and 40% of imports, the latter, which is double pre-war. So increasingly intertwined. And and again, I don't comments on the media side, but there's been more and more articles and reports that China's providing support to Russia and their war machine, ships, navigation equipment, war plane parts, other hardware. China's Wang Yi is just now in Moscow. I mean, this can't make Congress happy um, or, you know, Western governments. Why haven't we seen more pressure on China regarding Russia? Or is it there and we just aren't seeing it as much? So I think it's there. I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here, John. I'm going to, I'm going to sort of challenge some of the some of the rhetoric we've seen and some of the media um spin that we've seen in the last week I, I think what we're actually seeing is pressure from the us in particular i think us intelligence probably picked up some time ago that there was low level um, um contributions coming from chinese firms into the russia uh, the russia sort of military capability and i think this is another example of the west using intelligence in a fairly upfront way to 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 put a put a red line down just in time, just in time for Wang Yi to be in Moscow and probably before Xi visits Moscow, which is which is looking likely of Xi visiting Moscow sometime in April. Um, so this this line has been put down by the Americans, I think, quite a skillful way. And we mustn't forget, and we might come on to this as well, that the the um, Anthony Blinken visit to Beijing is still on the cards. I don't believe that that's completely off the cart. So I think what we are seeing is pressure from America to Beijing on onto Beijing, saying enough's enough and and no further. I, I I think I'd add to that by saying I'm not sure that this is in Xi's interest, President Xi's interest, to really hitch himself to to Putin's campaign in Ukraine at this time. Um, it, it's he he certainly can't see it as a as a successful campaign. And all he would be doing would be inviting Western sanctions, which at this time in the Chinese economy simply doesn't make sense. So I'm 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 doubtful that we're on the edge of seeing China launching itself into this war as a major a major ally of of, of Russia. Okay, so I'm glad you brought that second part in because I was thinking also about something where if Russia is increasingly isolated, their dependence on China could only rise. And what happens in, say, a year from now, where China is essentially the, as um, somebody else put it, I like the phrase, but uh, the bank and quartermaster to Russia. I mean, that seems very problematic, but I could see us going that way if this drags on and, you know, we're adding more sanctions on Russia this this week to, to commemorate the anniversary. I mean, what happens in that scenario? No, you're right, and this, this, so this, this risk, this is a dynamic risk, and this could grow over over 
certainly over the medium and long term, this could be this is an issue, which is why why we've got to be taking a holistic view here of how, how you know particularly the US engages with China as well as engages and how how the war is 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 continuing in Ukraine. The two issues cannot be delinked. But right now I'm not seeing it's optimal time for G to launch. In a year's time, let's have the conversation again, John. I mean and, and again the yeah, horrific yeah. scenario there. The horrific scenario here as we go through the rest of this decade is how does this how does this um war in Europe um in any way sort of become affected by increasing tension tensions in the South China Sea or around yeah. Taiwan? Now there's a there's a dread scenario there. That we have both tensions around Taiwan and ongoing tensions in Ukraine at the same time, and I'm pretty sure the policymakers in DC and in NATO will have that dread scenario somewhere on their grid, and will be and will be tracking the the indicators and the and the mitigants and to, to to try and prevent that from happening. All right. So one question before I go right to Taiwan, balloon issue. You mentioned Blinken's trip. <laughs> Obviously, that was. I mean, is this just you know? fascination by US media and it's already out of the news cycle or in a symptom of, or is it like, a, is this actually a big deal? Um, yeah, it is, well, it is a big deal and it isn't a big deal, I think. I mean, I think I'm, I'm going to be on the edge that it was, a, it was some kind of surveillance equipment. I'm not an expert in balloon technology, but I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to assume it's not a weather reading thing. Um, but I'm also going to sort of veer on the on the theory that this was this was there's a randomness about this than than a deliberate sort of high end sort of covert ploy. Um, so I, I I'm sort of I'm sort of saying yes, it probably was espionage. Does it does it change the sense of of of, of um, uh, in DC about about the Chinese surveillance of of America? Oh, uh, not really. There's, I think there's a great awareness of American of Chinese capabilities in, in terms of satellites, and there's, and frankly, there's a great awareness of other elements of Chinese espionage. I think I think the FBI, um, uh, this public source um, information that the FBI launched a new investigation to suspect Chinese espionage every every two weeks. I think in America, at least. Season. So I, 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 so I, I, I think it, it, it in itself. It doesn't really change the the sort of um, the, the the sense of threat or or, or 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 intrusion from China. However, in terms of a tactical piece, I think it was a gift to Blinken um, in terms of in terms of a, a reason to defer this meeting. And I think it is a deferral, not a cancellation, um, because I think Blinken would have been a bit exposed had he gone to Beijing before the anniversary of this war. If Blinken had gone to Beijing. And then Wang Yi had gone to Moscow and made a uh, made a, a, a grand statement in support of, of Putin. Blinken could have been exposed. So I think actually this has been carefully handled, and I think we will see Blinken in Beijing. I think we will see, as you say, that important channel sustained. And I do believe that we will continue to see um, the U.S. administration trying to put us trying to put a sort of floor on the relationship with with Beijing. Um, because right now it doesn't suit America to have tensions in the South China Sea. No, it doesn't really suit anybody. I mean, I continue to worry that that last year, 2022, was kind of the surprises came out of the West, whether you're looking at inflation or the war or you know anything. And I worry that this year the surprises are going to come out of the East in some way. Um, and the last time we spoke in November, and correct me if I'm wrong, you had felt that Taiwan wouldn't necessarily be a flashpoint this year, but it, neither was it on a 10-year horizon. Uh, where are you on this now? Any change to that view? No, no change at all, actually. I still I still think that next year we've got some we've got some interesting um or you know, in terms of scheduled uh, geopolitical events, we've got the US election, but we've also got elections in Taiwan. And I and I I think that, that, that watching the the, the the those Taiwanese elections will be interesting and the statements that come out of whoever wins whoever wins that in terms of a sense of of of, of pursuing independence or a more independent line, I think could be um either the provocation or, or the excuse for China to dial up um, and to dial up pressure um, on the island. Um so I at the moment I'm sticking to my line. I it's 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 on the horizon. It's not a middle of the century thing. It's something we must pay attention to this this decade. And that, and I'm coming at that because of the of the predictability of Chinese military capability. Um, as we see that grow towards twenty twenty seven and twenty twenty nine. Um, I think we need to pay attention to their capabilities, but um, they, I'm, I'm not at the moment. Absent some kind of of traumatic collapse of relations, um, or some some grand 
um, um, statement of independence for for Taiwan. I'm not seeing it being um, on the the immediate horizon. Job. Yeah, it still feels like things are you know slowly temperatures slowly rising still. I mean, you know, now we're yeah. sending 100 to 200 troops there. And again, that's not many people, but it's still the the signal of it. And last time we spoke, you felt an invasion was unlikely. You saw something more like a blockade. And and since we've had that conversation, I've you know, just dug into that a little bit myself and seen the, learned about the reliance on Taiwan for undersea cables that China could cut, that they rely on for communication. Taiwan imports most of its energy, more than 70% of their food. So two questions, is this still in your view, China's best option? And if so, like, I think it puts the West in a really interesting position. How do they respond? Do they run a block key? Do they, you know, yeah. I mean, I don't see them just firing on warships because of this, but how do you see that? Like, what would we think of as, as if, if, if that is, let's just say our, our, our base case, not to say it is, but then how do we, how do we see that playing out a little bit, the opening moves in response? Well, it's a. It, I tell you, it would be an extremely tense period. The, you know, the idea of the idea of, of China um, conducting some form of of sort of muscular sort of control of the island, either its data flows, as you say, or its or its shipments of, of raw materials or its exports, but effectively China China controlling access um, into Taiwan. Th- that will that will put the America and allies, Japan, Australia. On, on to, into a really tricky place, a really difficult spot. And so we will see a very tense state of global affairs, which is why America really doesn't need it right now where there's a war going on in Europe. Um, in terms of how that will roll out, well, I, we'll have to, this is again comes back to the importance of the US election next year. I know which president will order an American warship to intervene in, in, in a blockade of, of around Taiwan. So it's a, it's a hugely difficult sort of scenario to predict how, what the first moves would be like. We really are back into sort of Cuban Missile Crisis territory, I think, yeah. in terms of very broad analogies. Um, um, but I, I still believe that is a more likely scenario than, than an all-out invasion, because I think as we've, you know, a lesson from Ukraine is that invasions are difficult. My understanding, speaking to military observers, is an invasion of Taiwan would be extremely difficult. So I, I still believe that that's um, that wouldn't be the preferred option. In fact, I, st- I still actually think that the preferred option from 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 Xi, absent some form of external driver, is to is to conduct some kind of influence to convince to convince tai- uh, Taiwan that there is there is a sort of fudge in a relationship that brings reunification of the island, but um, but maintains some form of independence. Now that looks a lot like what was promised with Hong Kong. I'm just going to say that not be. Which has not been delivered, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if it was tried again. I really wouldn't be at all surprised if that was that was that was a, that was a, an approach that was tried again. Um, so I, I I I'm still in the camp that an invasion, a full on um, aggressive invasion of the island as first option is is unlikely. Yeah, I think that you the Hong Kong example is a real challenge to that story because you take any metric, whether it's you know per capita income, GDP, or anything like that and look at Taiwan from five years ago and Hong Kong from five years ago, and it's just dramatically underperformed yeah. in Hong Kong. Yeah. So yeah. I'll have to sell that or, or or say, okay, this is not how we're going to do it, I think, rather than use it as an yeah. example. Um, all right, so China shifting a little bit kind of more internally, I suppose. Um, they reopened much sooner than I would say probably even they expected, <laughs> you know, at this at last time we spoke. Uh, so their internal policies, you know, they've changed dramatically. Do you think there's any implications for some of the economic moves for um, how China's external and international focus changes? I'm, I don't actually. I'm, I, I, I'm I, again. I'm of, I'm of the view that the, 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 the fact that they did that head spinning sort of turnaround on on the COVID lockdown, and you know what, Xi's power hasn't really been challenged. Is is simply for me reflects just how carefully Xi has put in his foundation of his power. Around him in, in the party, particularly after the Congress, the Congress le- last year. So I'm not. I'm. I. I think that was a head spinning decision about about COVID, and um, a huge number of of, of Chinese um, 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 uh, people people suffered after that 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 over uh, that lockdown uh, was was reopened. But in terms of the foreign policy uh, posture, I'm not seeing a big shift. I'm seeing. I'm seeing a. Um, a, 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 a focus on local neighborhood security issues. We're seeing 
We're seeing talks at the moment in Beijing with India on the border dispute with India. We're seeing talks in Japan at the moment for the first time in, in quite a long time, security, high level talks with Japan on on, the, on regional security issues. And I think we're seeing China reaching out to the global south to project leadership. And I think that's the long term, one of the long term foreign policy goals. I, I, we've, we've seen it already in the last 10, 13 years with the Belt and Road Initiative. I think that will go through an evolution, but the, the bottom line will be that China will be will be staking its claim to be leading the global south. And I tell you, just looping back to Ukraine, John, I think at the end of this week, we'll probably see um, some form of proposal about some sort of peace settlement uh, in Ukraine coming from Beijing. Um, I strongly suspect that that will be aimed as much at the global south as it will be at the participants, mm. the belligerents in the war. So I think Chinese foreign policy hasn't really shifted. I think they've got economic pressures. They, 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 they need to, they need to um, be progressing the, in terms of productivity, in terms of, in terms of GDP, and against the backdrop of a population that's peaked. So I think they, they've got internal drivers um, to, to, that will shape the foreign policy, but they won't really shift what we've seen so far. So with the population having peaked, the the economic pressures, lots of stuff around about less decoupling, French shoring, reshoring. And I, you know, I think that that is happening, but how much of that, how much decoupling from the West or maybe by the West is even, is possible? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm taking the view that there, there will be a form of decoupling, um, you know, that, that security will start to feature, national security will feature, but in particular sectors. So I think it's going to be very asymmetric. Um, it'll be asymmetric across sectors. It will be asymmetric across Western allies. You know, Volkswagen sells something like forty percent of their vehicles in China, and I don't. I just don't think they're going to give up on that market. So I, I think in in some sectors with some countries, we will see um, security overriding costs in terms of supply chains, and we will see relocation or at least. Um, um, you know, plus one, a factory in India as well as a factory in, in China. I, I think that will happen in high-end areas of technology or anything anything that is perceived to be national, critical national security. But in other areas, I don't think there'll be much decoupling at all, John. I think it will it will continue. I think the, the, the complexities are such and the volume is such that, um, that, that we won't see much of a difference. Um, but there will be tensions. And as we've seen elsewhere, these, these moves toward decoupling can build a momentum of themselves. You know, there can be arguments. And in, India is in a good position to to benefit from this sense. I think India would be a, the chief competitor. You know, the idea that India becomes the factory to the world, not China, could be one of the long-term rivalries that we see played out in Asia in the coming century, the coming two decades. So I, I, I think there is a trend towards this. I, I don't think it's going to be reversed, but I certainly think it will be uneven, it will be limited initially to national security sectors. Um, um, and it will be it will be there'll be a lot of hedging going on between the countries in the region. Um, and the and the one to look out for in my book is India benefiting from this trend. I think we also need to be a little cognizant of oversimplifying some of this stuff. Like right? there's been a bunch of reports and even just some of the data shows that for example Mexico is gaining share for input into the U.S. market from China. But if you look at some of the details, it's it's the same Chinese company that's now opening yeah. a factory in Mexico yeah. instead of China. Yeah. So it's, you know, are we real? Is that are things necessarily changing in that regard? So yeah. it's a little more complex yeah. than just, oh, it's it is. It, exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't think, I, don't, I, don't, I just don't, I don't think we're, we're, going, we're looking at a sort of traumatic um, cleaving of, 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 of these supply chains. That involve China, I, 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 I do not think that's going to happen. But I think in particular areas, we will see we will see a trend towards a different kind of resilience in the in the supply chains that will involve other countries apart from China. Yeah, so we're seeing that especially in the chip sector. But um, all right, I was shifting gears to to Iran because you know again thinking about how we've had. Energy prices have come a little bit off the radar, but I still worry about things because I just don't think that the supply side is necessarily opening up there. But I worry we kind of forget about the whole with the tensions with Iran and the and the nuclear deal comes and goes, and we just, you know there's just bigger problems out there. But um, it could have a direct potential impact on global energy prices 
And I, you know, we know that Iranian drones have been used actively in Ukraine, often against civilian infrastructure. Why haven't we seen more pressure against Iran? Or, or is there really, are we at a stage where the West, there's nothing really we can do at this point? Yeah, I think, I think it's the, I think it's the latter. I think, I think we're running out of levers really with Iran. And it's really interesting that it is off the, it's, it's, it's fallen off the radar in many spaces. It's certainly on my radar. I think Iran and the, and the nuclear deal in particular is, is well and truly on my, on my radar. I think it's, I think it's, if it's hanging by a thread, it's a very thin thread, that nuclear deal, partly because there is no political space. The, the, the drone sales to Russia, the, 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 the oppressive um, reaction to demonstrations, I think, has removed political space in the West to give concessions. Um, um, and so I, I, and then we've had the breaking news in the last 10 days or so that, that um, international uh, inspectors have discovered very highly um, 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 sort of um, enriched uranium in Iran. Now, that was a surprise. That was hitting up at 84% enriched. Um, they're generally seen as a th- very close to a threshold of, of where where a, where a nuclear weapon could be could be could be constructed. So that is alarming, actually. And there's a, there's a debate going on at the moment as to whether that's a deliberate uh, production line or there's some form of um, um, error in, in the in the monitoring. We'll, we'll 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 know more at the beginning of March. But um, that that's that, that it simply reminds us that there's a lot of anxiety in the region about the the path to nuclearization or nuclear weapons uh, in, 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 in Iran, and there are other actors involved, chiefly Israel, in terms of what they would do in, in a, with a self defense um, 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 motive. So I think you're right to raise Iran. I think the, the the nuclear deal is hanging by a thread if it's still alive at all. I'm very worried by that nuclear news last week. And the, the final thing I'd say on Iran really is the the, the, the persistence of the, the civil protests. They haven't gone away. They might have fallen off the off the front the front sheet of our newspapers. But my understanding is those protests are continuing, and that tenacity and that longevity to those protests does suggest there could be potential here, where 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 in the longer term we are looking at something that could really affect the, the stability of the regime in Tehran. And that's it. And I wasn't saying that two months ago, John. I I, I think yeah. I've watched these I've watched these demonstrations um, persist, and I think that's something we'll be tracking um, for the rest of this year. Yeah, and, and when it comes to other actors, obviously the not recent but somewhat recent change in government in Israel creates a lot of questions on yeah. potential response, and then also you know, Saudi U.S. relations haven't are not exactly at their peak either, so. What are the risks? Do you see any other risks around, you know, because the situation in Iran escalates, do we repair some of the relations with Saudi? I mean, how does, it feels like a really complex web right now where with no good relation, no, nothing like awful like Iran to US, but the relations aren't exactly smooth anywhere in the region. No, they're not. And also you act as, you know, we, the landscape has changed considerably. And um, um, uh, with 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 effectively Saudi Arabia standing up to become its own it, 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 in an independent sort of power, it's no longer the automatic ally of, of the West. It's being it's being courted by China. I think it's the it's, it's its biggest customer is now China. And so I I I, I think there's there's a different sort of there's a different sort of um, um, choreography going on in the Middle East than we've seen in the last fifty years. Now I think I think America's and the West is is adapting to this, but the rules have changed. I think, and I think there'll be a different set of relations in Saudi Arabia now. Its bottom line is that Saudi Arabia still have a huge rivalry with Iran, although re- relations have improved. There has been direct contact um, uh, with 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 Tehran, albeit in 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 a third country. So I I I think I think we do need to look out for relations with Saudi. I don't think. That they are automatically against the West. I think we should be seeing the Saudi posture as a, as a as a statement of independence, as it were, away from block politics. And as we go into this new um, global sort of um, configuration, I think countries like Turkey, like Saudi Arabia, like Israel, like Japan, will we will have a more prominent and a slightly more independent sort of sense of foreign policy. And we'll see we'll see examples of this. We'll see examples throughout you know, related to different nations, energy transition, wars in Europe, wars in this, in 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 in, um, in in Southeast Asia, uh, our tensions in Southeast Asia. I think we will see these 
uh, these new relationships played out in, in those spaces, John. All right. Moving a little bit east as we come to the conclusion of this podcast, but it, again, off the radar, I would say from the day to day, you've mentioned this in the past, Pakistan, the floods, the economic situation, it looks even more dire than the last time we spoke. And I remind listeners, this is a nuclear armed country with, let's just say, poor relations with its nuclear armed neighbor. Yeah, that yeah, for sure. Thank you for raising this. I, I'm conscious it's it's a it's a it can, it can be a sort of personal hobby horse of mine. I spent a great deal of my career involved in South Asia. Um, it does matter. It matters for those reasons. To a population of 220, 230 million people living in Pakistan in dire conditions, and at, at the moment there really is an a, a, a conflagration of crises, which is sort of unheard of. We've got, as you say, we're recovering from from those floods. Those uh, those terrible floods, um, but the economy is is nose diving, and uh, relations with the negotiations with IMF to 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 which would at least put a sticking plaster, at least put the brake on this decline. Uh, those negotiations have failed in the last week, and it looks like they're failing this week. I'm I'm keeping my eye open for breaking news today and, and tomorrow, but um, that's not a good sign. If we can't get an IMF deal into Pakistan, then the decline will continue. Um, and at the same time, same time as the recovering from the floods, same time as the economic decline, we've got unprecedented political turbulence involving civilian parties and the military power, which are a significant actor in, in Pakistan. And that combination is is rather unusual and it doesn't bode well for the future. So I think Pakistan, we do need to track, um, and not least because it lives in a very conflictive environment. It's got a, an uptick in terrorism attacks coming from groups in Afghanistan. And as you say, it's got this persistent rivalry and tension um, breaking into confrontation with India on its eastern border. Um, so yes, that is that is a point of worry, actually. And it's a point of worry, by the way, for India. The last thing India needs on its western border is a failed nuclear state. It really is. So I think that that's something to look out for uh, as we go through this year. Okay. So what else are you worried about? This is my open-ended, you know, what are we not thinking about? Well, election. It's, it's int- well, we've got elections and we've got elections um, coming up in many places. Um, uh, but next year, the Turkish election is coming up. I think er- Erdogan's in a in a really interesting place. He's been challenged after the 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 the, um, the earthquake and the and the sort of um, his his policies that the, 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 and and a, and a degree of cronyism in 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 the construction business in, in Turkey. We'll, we'll see that play out. How it will affect his position, which is already a bit wobbly in 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 the in the election. We'll see. But Erdogan is a survivor, and I'm, I'm not I'm not ruling him out of a, of a victory in, in these elections. Turkey is Turkey is a really interesting actor in many many theaters. Obviously, in the Ukraine piece. Um, it's it's the guardian of the Black Sea. It's critical to the grain deal, which is surviving. Yeah. And we're still seeing grain shipped from the, from the region, but it's also very active in Central Asia and in North Africa and the Middle East as well. So Turkey is an uh, uh, is an interesting um, uh, act to, uh, act to be tracking. And also, it, uh, we mustn't forget that it holds the key at the moment to the expansion of NATO. As you recall, Finland and Sweden are, are queuing up, ready to get in, and we're waiting for Hungary and Turkey. To, to ratify that deal. My sense is that Anthony Blinken's trip last week on the back of the elect, uh, the back of the earthquakes, I'm pretty sure that item number two on the agenda was NATO expansion. And I still remain confident that that expansion will happen um, it, one way or the other. I think there's some, there's some timelines coming up in the, in, in the coming months that should they should drive that forward. So Turkey, Turkey's a thing. I think the North Korea, we've seen North Korea um, um, intercontinental missiles being tested. I still have a sense there that that North Korean tension is being managed. And we're, we're, Japan is stepping up. Japan has doubled its defense budget. And I think we're we're seeing a much tighter use of, of, of alliances in the region with, again, America in a leading role. But my sense is the threat from North Korea, uh, we, we, we may be moving towards a much more classical deterrence model with much much tighter alliances standing up to 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 try and dampen down any aggression from from North Korea, but it's a fragile state of affairs, open to misinterpretation, um, as we've seen, open to sort of accidents or perceived accidents from exercises in the area. So I think it, I, I, we mustn't rule out North Korea as something which can destabilize the international order in the coming twelve months, John. Okay, great. 
Well, thank you, Scott. I deeply appreciate you updating us every few months with your views and any changes and what the rest of us should be worried about out there. Um, it's always fascinating to get the update. So I very much appreciate you joining us. It's my pleasure. Anytime. Thank you, John. All right. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Be sure to follow us on social media to get other episodes in the series the moment they're published. And if you liked what you heard today, hit that like button so it's easier for others to find. Thank you very much. I'll speak to you next time.